I'm Bob Mitteke. I'm with Biz Talk Texas for the Biz Talk Texas podcast. Uh, tell me about yourself. Who are you? I'm Dr. J. David Winningham. And uh, before I got into this business of the nursery with my late wife, I spent my career traveling the world literally as a rocket scientist. I have a PhD in physics. And uh, I worked at uh, Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio where we did uh, research for NASA, building satellites to all sorts of different planets like Jupiter and Mars and Venus and what have you. And after a career of traveling all over the world, I got tired of it. Really? That, and that seems my, hard to do. And my, my late uh, wife, uh, who was the head of the math department at the Bernie uh, High School, uh, she got tired after 30 years of bad kids. And no matter whether you teach in the advanced ones, after 30 years they can get pretty uh, wearing. Both of us uh, had uh, came from both rural and small town environments and we really never got out of the uh, plant business in terms of uh, gardening and uh, both vegetable and plants, etc. We started out living uh, in Fair Oaks Ranch. Okay. And then as retirement approached, and we'd gotten, at that time, we really got into the South Texas, West Texas, Hill Country plants, and we couldn't find a lot of them because there's not any profit, and so the growers were not growing them. But one of them in particular was the Texas Hill Country Madrone, okay. the Western Madrone. And we uh, were determined that we were going to uh, be able to learn how to grow them, and we did. And that's one of our primary products here is the... Uh, a hill country uh, variety of the madrone tree. And see, so both of us had very professional jobs, but we're always uh, into gardening of both the food variety and the uh, yard variety. And so as retirement approached, San Antonio was creeping up on Fair Oaks. When we bought in 82, and, or 80, and then built in 82, it was rural. By the uh, late 90s, it was beginning, or the mid-90s, it was beginning to be... Uh, in, not out. And so we had started in the early uh, 90s looking for potential retirement uh, properties. And we literally looked from San Antonio to El Paso. Wow, that's a, that's uh, we, a big distance. A big distance because, we, again, we wanted to find some place which met our uh, desires about plants, uh, having you know, having uh, already a nice stands of some of the trees, plants, etc. So we literally looked all over the place. One of the factors we had to take into account that my uh, late wife was a uh, at that time a roughly 30 plus year survivor of cancer. Wow. And uh, she uh, actually had was diagnosed six months into our marriage, and so uh, that was one of the reasons that she. Uh, decided that she'd had enough after the 30 years, she had the required number of years and things to retire with almost full retirement. And so he says, ah, we'll just go ahead and we'll find our dream place in the hill country. So after looking literally uh, all over here to West Texas for four and a half years, we bought this place in tw under 12 hours. <laughs> Well, that you made you, you already made your decision well, by the time we you had, saw what it. we had done is is that we had really over that four year period we had learned a lot about what you don't want around here, particularly with water and everything. What we want was something with live water with uh, a wide spectrum of the uh, unique plants, trees, flowers, etc., to the hill country. And fortunately, this one pretty well had it all. It had madrones. So my wife saw all the madrones. On the property at that time when we bought it, it was it looked like across the road over there, full of cedar or truly juniper trees. It was thick, but we could see the potential. And so, in under 12 hours, we bought it. Hmm. And then spent. Uh, and my mother had moved uh, in with us. We had a our family farm up in Central Texas by a little town of Mahala, and uh, she had run the uh, ranch for about 10 years after my father had passed away, but it came too much for her to do. And she said, well, if you don't want to live here, let's sell it. So we did sell it, and she moved here and lived with us in the Fair Oaks. And luckily, within about a year of her coming, we found this place that had a little small cabin, which is the body of us behind us right here. And we remodeled it for her so she could have a place out here in the uh, country. And she was quite happy. In fact, she 
had a long-term friend that she had known way back when in World War II who had uh, moved here and uh, to Kerrville. Mm. And uh, in fact, the lady was a nurse and she was a Bataan survivor. Really interesting story that my mother had told me long ago about this lady and anyway, the lady was living here. So she quickly made friends and so it worked well, this place, uh, for her. And then we spent uh, about four or five years clearing the property. No bulldozers, no nothing but uh, workers with chainsaws. So we cut it, made it what you see now, did lots of improvements on the property, etc. And uh, it, the uh, nursery, when my wife, uh, my mother passed away, and then due to her cancer recurring, and then my wife says, hey, I'm just going to you know, go ahead and retire from school teaching and come out here and I want to do a nursery full time because we've been doing stuff part time at our place in Fair Oaks and when we had this we made a little compound down here and to do it my mother sort of uh, kept it up and my late wife says nah I want to do this full time I'm you know, tired of the kids and so <clears throat> she began to grow it and the Hispanic gentleman you saw walking by Pablo he was one of the original crew that uh, did the clearing here and uh, he and my wife hit off a great friendship, and she did a lot of things of like improving his English and math and other stuff like that. But it turns out he was great on plants because he had grown up uh, with his grandfather, as did the rest of the siblings, uh, in Mexico. And the grandfather was a curandero, one of the you know medicine men types, herbalist in Mexico. So he was very familiar with, with plants and really liked it. <clears throat> and so after the uh, property was cleared, uh, pretty well and, and brought back to near original state he and his brother says you know could we come work here in this nursery and the ranch and stuff to try to improve it so he said sure and so there was still a good bit of work to do to improve it and then uh, it just gravitated where he and my wife really started expanding the amount of things that were being grown mm -hmm. and it, as people say well how did y'all get into this I said it's a hobby run amok it's one of those many things which can you can say got out of hand. But in reality, it was really good for my late wife because clearly being a long-term cancer survivor, you never, never, never know, you know what the ultimate fate will be, or the when, et cetera, or the how. And she was lucky she was able to spend about six or seven years doing this, mm -hmm. improving the nursery before, unfortunately, the... Uh, cancer that uh, had started out with as Hodgkin's and then breast cancer came back in her lungs and, and spades and it was not curable at that time and so that was it and I uh, took partial retirement to take care of her and after she passed away rather suddenly actually from a heart attack rather than directly from the cancer I said you know I don't really need this anymore I don't really need work full time I don't need financial don't need otherwise so I I uh, did a partial retirement where I spend, I still do uh, one day a week in San Antonio, uh, where I do the nursery, and we've grown it, Pablo and I have really grown it in size since uh, she did it. We've also done a lot of you know, ranch improvements with uh, a lot of help from people that he knows in terms of uh, improving the property here. And it really, the nurseries, which specializes in hill country and western native plants, is really you have to classify it as a business. It's more or less like a B and B. It attracts a certain type of uh, clientele who are really environmentally uh, interested, who are very water conscious, who understand that there are some very unique and beautiful plants that can be used here. That you don't have to bring in exotics. Uh, and um, it's not a monster money maker, but I don't really have to make a whole lot of money. I just have to keep it going and cash flow positive. And uh, for both my late wife and myself, there's another aspect of it being kind of like a B and B, namely it brings a lot of interesting people. Mm -hmm. Because naturally, again, it's not the same crowd who's just going to go to Walmart, or Home Depot, or Lowe's to buy plants. It's someone who specially wants to come to do things which are native to this area, and that by and large means you meet a very interesting broad eclectic group of people right who come to your doorstep 
And so it, it's a great... Uh, or come back by a quarter to five. And, a, quarter, uh, a quarter to five, no problem, et cetera, et cetera. Later on, people say, oh, the queen comes and says, look, the business is on the ranch. You know, we don't ever really close because we're living here. And so if it's become, as a retirement thing, for me, it's a great socialization deal because you meet such a breadth of people. Right. Uh, coming here, and it's very positive uh, mentally, psychologically, socially, etc., because you interact with people at their best. Right. They're coming for uh, for very positive reasons, and you, see, you can very quickly see the uh, result of it. And we we can be very low pressure since we don't have to make a lot of money and just have to keep it cash flow positive. And that means it can be a lot of fun. Right. It can be fun for the customers also. And it can be an experience for them because, again, like a B&B, it's not just a room like Hilton, it's a place. It's, it's an, an experience. experience. It's an experience for the people, and it, that's important. We've, I found out over the years that's very important because as a country, America has rapidly urbanized, you know, in the post-World War II period and even more so recently, and there's a great disconnect. So much of uh, the American population, particularly the younger ones, let's say the under 40s, have never experienced a rural and our small town environment. They really are tied, in fact, they just tied to the big cities. In fact, it's where the amusing times, sometimes I'll get a call because the number's up on the sign by the gate saying, can we drive on this road? Because it's gravel. Right. And you realize, hey, there's people who've never driven on anything except concrete. True, true. And are just terrified. Yeah. And, and of course, there's a cattle guard, et cetera, and it's just as, as though it were, a, a, you know, a 500-foot-tall uh, barrier uh, to coming in. So I say it, it brings, you know, a, a very interesting experience and also uh, allows a lot of people, because we let people walk around, et cetera, to uh, gain an experience, uh, not only about plants and things, but about the hill country, because if you think about it, uh, very few people have access to the countryside. City parks, state parks, etc. But most of the really good stuff is behind locked gates. True, true. And so very few people in the modern American urban environment have a chance to see what nature's like. And so therefore, one of the things we get to do here is share a lot right. with people to, oh, geez, we didn't realize things like this were around Kerrville. Oh, yes. Unfortunately, it's just that they're not, you know, accessible right. to most people. And so there, there's a whole host of positive aspects about being in a native plant business where you don't have to make a lot of money at it. So it, it's been a tremendous, tremendously broad and great experience. Tell and me about the Madrona plant. A uh, madrone. One of the things that we uh, madrone, I should talk say. about it's uh, la madrona in Spanish, is a broader context is, is that ten thousand years ago this was a damp, cold, wet climate during you know, the ends of the, of the last ice age, and during that period this was the area was very much different. The fauna, the flora, etc., were quite different. You know, much more lush. Uh, lots of things, uh, plants, which are now only found in little small microclimates, like these canyon environments here where we are. Uh, and so uh, you'll find things like, if you look right over there, there's a cherry tree. You won't go out anywhere and find cherries, all sorts of things like that. And one of those, they can really be referred to as vestigial plants, namely something just left over from an earlier time, a, a earlier, larger ecosystem. And the madrones are one of those uh, trees, and the reason it's so fascinating to people, one is evergreen, so it's green, have green leaves all year, but the way its bark sheds, the bark peels off about this time of year, it's peeling off kind of like a birch peels off, and leaves a very creamy colored uh, uh, sub bark underneath it, which then subsequently hardens and then comes off again the next year. And uh, it has very beautiful, white, almost globe-like flowers in the spring and in the fall. Uh, the berries are uh, rather almost burnt orange, Texas, University of Texas burnt orange color. 
very, very difficult to propagate, etc. And that's one of the things that got us into the native plant business with the lack of a place to buy them. The madrone is in the same family as a rhododendron. Okay. Some people don't realize that. Uh, madrones are restricted to very few places, some close to Austin, around the hill country here. The next big extensive populations are out in the uh, uh, Big Bend area up in the mountains and then over in the uh, uh, Gualapi Park are the biggest areas where the uh, populations of them uh, remain. And then you have to jump over into parts of New Mexico, you'll find them, and then, and then into middle Arizona there's some, and then there's a coastal type of a drone out in the uh, Washington, Oregon, California, and there's even a tropical version I have propped in Costa Rica. And I was walking out in the woods one day in the forest and looked up and said, huh, that looks familiar. It was this monster, about a 100-foot tree, and realized it was a tropical madrone. Wow. So it's a very big uh, family. There's uh, examples of it uh, in Europe. It's called a strawberry tree in the Mediterranean area, uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy, southern France, Provence, etc. And so it's uh, it's unique in its bark. The look of its bark and the fact that it's evergreen, the fact that it's a very rare and an almost endangered species, and it has a very high desirability. In fact, I had someone come today who wanted a couple of them, three gallon ones, and I just put aside five for a customer from uh, Midland because they're, I think, as far as I know, either the last or only one or two people still growing them in Texas. So it's it is a highly desirable sort of specialty tree which the connoisseur it's like fine wine sort of routine that rare fine vintage of plant that people desire right does it have a fruit it has a fruit which is about the size of a uh, buckshot it's orange in color uh very fleshy actually you can eat it and it usually has two to three little seeds on the inside and one of the problems with it surviving here is that uh very few of the trees are terribly fertile. We're lucky to have uh, several native ones here which are fertile and are produce, their seeds produce quite well. Uh, it's a very, very difficult process of extracting the seeds and getting them to grow. It took us about 10 years to perfect wow. the process, and that's one of the reasons they're pricey is because it takes a okay. lot of labor okay. uh, to do it. And again, it's like anything. It's like the difference between a jug wine and a great Beaujolais or what have you that in terms of people who are plant connoisseurs. Right. We do other specialty trees uh, here that are rare. There's witch hazels which are almost extinct. Uh, a variety here. Lots of other types of really you know, unique trees to the hill country. Cherries, other things like that. And I've shipped stuff <clears throat> over lots of places to New Mexico, even up as far as northern uh, uh, New York State, the Texas Buckeyes and things like that. It's Is it difficult to grow once you have the plant? It's not difficult to grow as long as you follow instructions. Mm -hmm. It's a very hardy tree. In fact, uh, once it is, it has to get its root system established. And once you, it gets its root system established, it's quite hardy. Uh, they can stand, you know, pretty bitter weather. In fact, there used to be, there's a cliff back here a little bit further down the canyon. There was one literally growing out of a crack in the side of a cliff and going up. Unfortunately, the wind broke it and killed it, but that's about as near nothing soil as you can want as a crack right. in the side of a uh, cliff here in the hill country. The wood itself is as dense as mahogany. Mm, okay. It'll dull a chainsaw. We've had some that'll die, and people will want the wood because it makes a very beautiful... Uh, wood. A lot of people like to turn it to make little boxes and jewelry boxes and stuff like that. And you have to sharpen the chainsaw a whole lot Wow! to cut through it because it's just very, very dense. Because it grows slowly. Slow and dense. And Is there anything that you've learned starting this out here that you didn't know when you started? Oh gosh. The list is too long to... Uh, to do, obviously, you're learning. My uh, formal training, obviously, was in physics. I have a PhD in physics. Spent a lifetime, you know, at that, particularly rocket science, doing things, you know, for NASA, etc., going to the planets, so forth. Uh, the botanical portion was that, say, both my wife and I were from rural environments. I grew up on a cotton farm, so it was sort of in the blood routine. 
And uh, one of the things that I joke with people is, what does it mean to get something like a PhD, particularly in physics? So the answer is you finally learn to learn. That's a key. And in this case, both my wife and I just, you know, we'd had botany courses in college and stuff like that, but almost everything we did was taught ourselves, right. both from books and just from experiences of working from it. Uh, and I would actually say uh, probably some of the most important things I've learned are more about the interactions that you have with people and the relationship to nature and the dis the uh, fact that, as I've said, as I've said before, that uh, people have been so disjointed away from nature due to the necessary urbanization of the country that uh, you really find that there is a longing and a lack of knowledge among the urban population. And when you see people's faces, you know, and interact with them, particularly as they walk back and not only to the nursing, go back and look further down the canyons and stuff like that, it's a rather interesting psychological, sociological learning experience. Something which to me was quite normal, even though I had a big time career, traveled the world, etc. I was still well grounded on the cotton farm. Right. You know, the country was in my blood sort of routine. I grew up in a single walled house with heat from uh, just a, a fireplace and a wood stove my grandmother cooked on sort of routine. And so <clears throat> I tend to forget, even though I travel the world, that most of the population of this country has no relationship to the country, no knowledge, etc. cetera. And, and, and when you learn that, it's interesting how you can pass things on, learn from people how uh, that lack of knowledge of nature in the country is affecting people's psyches and stuff like that. So I would say learning about people, modern day society is probably one of the most fascinating aspects of having done this, not just the plants or anything else. It's a good exercise, you know, you get out and you're working away. I'm 76 and still kicking. Well, I... Uh... I think I've asked all I really need to ask you. Uh, I appreciate the interview, and I will uh, put this on iTunes, and I want to take a couple pictures, and if you'll ch take me around, I'll take some pictures of some of your plants that I can put okay, with Okay, what we do is we'll hop in. Uh, I'll go trade the Jeep for the Kubota because it's a lot nicer to go around in. Okay. My 78 Jeep is... I mean, if you know... If, it's service if, if you're not real busy. No, no, no. <laughs> you see how busy... Uh, Myself and the cats are here. <laughs>